Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? We just joined the room, so I just want to see if the host is around. We can. Hello, yes, I hear you. Can you hear us? So we are live, is that correct? Okay, thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much for those writing in the chat. The sound is okay. Unfortunately, we didn't have time to test ahead of uh, joining. And I assume there are still people arriving on site in the room. I'm also trying to find the the image for the room, but unfortunately I can't. Niti Namrata, uh, oh, can you see? Oh yeah, now I can see the room. Okay, people are still gathering, I think. Um, And my colleague from the room is telling me that they still don't have um, Zoom uh, in the room. Can the host please tell me when we, we are live on site as well? Anastasia, one second. There's folks, folks, if you could please, if you guys could all go because we're starting our session now. Thank you so much. Or you can stay. Hey, see you. <laughs> <laughs> so wonderful. Sorry, Anastasia, we're just getting the room together can now. Can you hear us okay? Us, right? All right. I'm going to take another second. Hey. Hi, Mallory. Can you hear us and see us well? It's a, we can see you, but it's a bit soft. Um, and yeah, thanks to everybody in the room. Sorry about the scheduling. It's, it was just a miss, um, I don't know, a miss schedule, I guess. So we're starting later than we thought. Um, and I think we won't go um, for the full planned 90 minutes. We'll cut it short so that folks don't lose their lunch break. Um, but yeah, I'll hand it over to you, Anastasia. Hopefully we can get the audio fixed. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm going to start, but please do let me know if the RD is still not working okay. Um, I think it's better now. I did some testing. Yeah. Okay, hello and welcome everyone. Um, it's so good to see people arriving still on site. There are many people and also those joining us online. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, we do have just one hour today for this session due to um, uh, a confusion in scheduling. So I'm afraid we'll have to skip um, uh, the first part, which was the poll. Um, but if we have time, we'll do it at the end of the session. Uh, so I'll begin, um, I'll dive right in uh, with introductions uh, and um, uh, I just wanted to start with introducing uh, myself and my colleagues who are here with me today. Um, my name is Anastasia Vladimirova and I'm security lead at Huridocs and also a digital security trainer. Uh, with the CyberStar project of the Sector Foundation. But today uh, I am actually uh, not wearing any of these hats. I'm here in my personal capacity. And I'm very, very um, grateful to have this opportunity uh, to speak um, and uh, to share this platform with you at the IGF, uh, to moderate and to speak about um, 
the importance of encryption in the work of human rights defenders, because this is an issue that I care deeply about myself and I witnessed as part of my work in the field firsthand. Uh, I want to also introduce um, the outstanding and amazing speakers who uh, have joined me here today. Uh, Namrata Maheshwari, who is Asia Pacific Council at Access Now, an international nonprofit that works on digital rights, where she also coordinates the organization's global work on encryption. Mallory Nadel, uh, who is Chief Technology Officer at the Center for Democracy and Technology. Uh, Mallory is a, a public interest technologist who takes a human rights, people-centered approach to technology implementation with a focus on encryption, censorship, and cybersecurity. And last but not least, Nisi Bayani, Policy and Advocacy Manager at the Internet Society, a global nonprofit organization with the vision that the Internet is for everyone and that works towards an open, globally connected, secure and trustworthy Internet. She's based in New Delhi, India. Human rights defenders all over the world rely on encryption to protect themselves against an array of threats, from authoritarian governments to businesses, as well as private and non-state actors. Encryption helps human rights actors to ensure their own and their colleagues' security and safety, to protect personal, valuable, and sensitive data, and to express themselves freely without fear of intimidation and repercussions from adversaries. However, ever since encryption has made its way into the daily lives and work of human rights defenders, both non-democratic and democratic governments have been trying to restrict and undermine the use of encryption through a variety of means. This deliberate targeting of encryption does not only affect the exercise of fundamental human rights, um, such as the right to privacy and the right to freedom of expression, but oftentimes it directly targets human rights actors and disproportionately affects their work. Um, here we wanted to go uh, and show you uh, a quick video that was produced by the Global Encryption Coalition. Um, as part of the Global Encryption Coalition Day, uh, Encryption Day um, 2022. But we'll share the link to this in, in the chat in Zoom, and we definitely encourage you to check out those, um, those videos later on your own, because we unfortunately don't have time for now. Um, so without further ado, I actually want to dive right into the first question, which I'd like to address to Namrata and Niti. Namrata and Niti. Your organizations are at the forefront of the fight for digital rights and open uh, internet globally, supporting uh, human rights actors in many different ways, from advocacy to direct digital security assistance. Could you please speak about the role of the end-to-end -end encryption in enabling privacy and security, particularly as it relates to work of human rights actors? Thank you. Sure, um, I can get us started and then hand it over to Neeti. Uh, thank you so much, Anastasia, and thank you all for joining us both on site and online. Just to uh, just so we know, can you hear me clearly? Yes, yeah, we can. can Perfect. All right. Um, so, encrypted platforms enable privacy and security in an online environment where there are several blurred lines about how much of your information is accessed, how much of it is retained, and by whom. And I think here it's important to contextualize end-to-end -end encryption. Offline and online spaces are by no means directly comparable. The threat models are widely different. But in the offline space, to a great degree, one has the option of secure spaces for communication. And end-to-end -end encryption makes that possible in an online environment where communications data is otherwise generated, accessed, stored and even disclosed in ways that are not completely transparent or even comprehensible, especially in today's environment with increasing use of surveillance technology and spyware. So on a daily basis, encryption allows people to voice unpopular opinions freely, have private conversations with family and friends, share confidential business information, or even have private conversations with your doctor, your lawyer, or a journalist. When such end-to-end -end encrypted safe spaces are not easily available, every individual is affected. But as Anastasia pointed out, it has a disproportionate impact on human rights defenders, activists, dissidents, and vulnerable communities who are often targeted for what they say and who they speak with. 
In regions hit by crisis or repressive regimes, online safety has a very tangible connection to physical safety as well. For example, communications data or location data online that is not secure is used to track down individuals and to persecute them. And here I'll just very quickly share some observations that our 24 seven digital security helpline has had um, in terms of attacks on privacy and the need for secure channels for communication. There has been a significant increase in cases from regions going through social unrest or any kind of social political crisis. There's a high level of cases related to account security of arrested activists. And they've also seen a huge increase in adaptation to encryption tools, especially from civil society and human rights defenders and in the context of communication platforms for messaging and emails. This is true particularly in regions where there is a crisis of ind independent media safety, for example. So this tells us a bit about the kind of attacks we're seeing, the kind of people who are affected to varying degrees and the need for encryption, especially in today's context. Neeti, over to you. Thanks, thanks so much, Namita. Um, you know, very much like uh, what Namita has already laid out for us. Um, you know, if if I were to add or draw a parallel between, you know, what an end-to-end -end encrypted space would look like if, you know, we were physically imagining it, it would be two people standing on a very isolated hill somewhere, you know, where there could be nobody to listen to their conversation and they would be sure that there are no eavesdroppers, there is absolutely no surveillance and there is no intrusion into that conversation. And, you know, the privilege of having that closed door or, you know, a, a conversation on a hilltop with someone that you want to share that information with and only with that person, that is the online parallel um, or rather the offline parallel of an end-to-end of -end encrypted uh, communication system or data transfer system. Um, you know, uh, one of the, one of the um, sort of misnomers that I've very often come across is that end-to-end -end encryption is only limited to messaging and therefore it's extremely user-facing. Um, that's, that's not true at all. In fact, end-to-end um, -end encrypted spaces exist on email, um, cloud sharing, and uh, data transfers as well. Um, and, and, you know, end-to-end -end encryption is very, very closely connected with our physical safety. Also, it's the strongest digital security shield and the key to a safer internet. Anyone who connects online does that with the expectation that their connection, their experience would be safe and it would be trustworthy. And encryption is exactly that security technology that while playing a vital role in our day-to-day -day lives, many a times without us even realizing, you know, most of us take it for granted. Uh, the fact that our our transactions online, you know, or our ability to shop online would be would be encrypted, and therefore our data or our transactions would be safe from anyone who's trying to malicious, mal maliciously access those. So very very much like how you would lock your doors or how you would ask your child to lock their rooms, encryption gives us that security shield against being eavesdropped upon, against being attacked by malicious actors, again against being surveyed. Um, so, you know, there has been enough research by technologists, companies and civil society to prove how the privacy and the security that encryption offers us keeps marginalized populations like LGBTQ plus communities, journalists, activists, dissidents, children, women, the elderly, and especially human rights defenders. And, you know, all of these communities in one way or another depend on encryption to make sure that they have safe spaces to work and interact online. But now with the lines getting blurred more and more, our online safety means that we are also safe offline uh, with location tracking, with, you know, um, the, the ability to being identified based on our digital footprint. All of these have bigger and bigger ramifications on our physical safety as well. Um, so on, on the security aspect, I'm gonna pause it and hand it back to Anastasia. Thank you very much, Niti and Amrita, for, um, for these comments. Uh, I wanna uh, go straight to my next question because I think it will uh, build on what you just uh, said. Um, would you please, based on your experience, uh, could you please uh, share what are the most worrying threats to encryption that you've seen most recently, maybe in the past year? And has anything changed in the narratives uh, of the governments that aim to undermine or break encryption? 
This is also a question for Namrita and Niti. And of course, Mallory, if you want to jump in, that's uh, also, you're welcome to do that. I just wanted to check, Niti, do you want me to uh, take that first or? Great. Uh, thanks for that question, Anastasia. And I think um, there's a great deal of commonalities in the justifications underlying policies that threaten encryption across regions, whether it's in the Asia-Pacific or the Latin American region or EU and elsewhere. For example, uh, the traceability mandate in Brazil and then India and then Bangladesh, or efforts to undermine encryption to allow law enforcement access for a num number of, I'd say, purported goals, um, including, for example, to keep people safe online. Um, and of course, that's a grave issue, but um, I will go a little bit more into how weakening in in encryption is not the way to achieve it. All of these proposals essentially push the idea that giving up privacy online is essential to achieving online safety. Um, but that precisely is among the reasons why such proposals that threaten encryption are misplaced. Um, privacy versus safety is a false binary. Um, sorry, I'm, the video has frozen for me, so I just wanted to check if you can hear me fine. We can, yeah. We can. Perfect. All right. So uh, privacy versus safety, I think, is a false binary, like a lot of security experts have also demonstrated through research. The two are mutually reinforcing, and one cannot meaningfully exist without the other. So I think this is one very common thread between all these threats we're seeing uh, from various governments and sometimes even the private sector. The second is um, there's no such thing as end-to-end -end encryption that allows access when necessary. Uh, we don't have such technology. It's a zero-sum game. If a platform introduces the slightest possibility of circumventing encryption, it loses all the privacy and security promises of it. And this is bad for individuals, businesses, and even national security. The third, I'd say um, there are alternative means of identifying miscreants or preventing crime and keeping people safe online that don't come at such a great cost to fundamental human rights. And this is where the focus should be. Weakening encryption is ultimately just going to make the problem much worse and make everybody, including the more vulnerable um, sections of society that we're trying to keep safe online, it will make everybody unsafe. And fourth, most of these proposals are not backed by any demonstrable research on how breaking encryption will in fact increase online safety. So intentionality just by itself, good intentions behind policies are not enough. We need to look more at the tangible impact before destroying a tech that is currently among our best bets. Uh, as Neeti said, it's our best digital security shield for online privacy and security for goals that we are not even sure they will achieve. So um, I think the all these threats coming from governments, they're ultimately just going to jeopardize internet freedom, online safety, and privacy in a big way. Thanks, Thank Namrata. Um, oh, sorry, sorry, annotation. Um, sorry, uh, Namrata, big, big plus one to everything you said. Um, I think we're seeing sort of like, you know, similar trends across countries where they're asking for um, encrypted content or end-to-end -end encrypted content to be made available to law enforcement through one or the other way. And I'm going to quickly touch upon, um, you know, three ways in which governments are primarily asking for this to happen. There, there are other ways and there could be many, many other uh, short-sighted proposals that governments will come up with in the future as well. But the three, um, you know, big strands of these, these attempts to gain access are... Um, the first would be exceptional access. So this is law enforcement, um, you know, telling service providers to provide law enforcement access in a lawful and targeted manner. Now, Namita has already talked about how it's not possible at all on an end-to-end -end encrypted platform and how it's even, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, impossible and also unethical to let law enforcement do this on an encrypted platform because it's it's the same is the same thing as you know us giving a key of our door to law enforcement just because they are like trust us with your key you know nobody would do that um the second method would be client side scanning uh you know where services and platforms offering encryption are asked to scan for content on their platforms to check for you know child sexual abuse material unlawful content 
terrorism related content etc but that's that's the same as having sort of like you know this giant eye in your room all the time when you're having private conversations or when you're sharing personal thoughts or you know sort of like a stranger standing right behind me as i'm entering my credit card details or you know um transacting online uh, so client side scanning is very much like having that huge giant eye in my room all the time and the thought that we've seen, which is quite worrying, um, you know, in a lot of countries, is the ask of traceability. So this is uh, this is this is law enforcement asking, you know, um, service providers again and platforms to basically be able to make the originator of a certain message or a certain uh, information, certain data on their platform traceable. Um, and, and, you know, the ways that they're doing that is uh, by, by hashing and all of that. We don't need to get into the nitty gritties of how it may happen, how they may suggest it happens. But uh, all three of these methods, as Namrata has already said, you know, they, they have one thing in common, that they put the security of billions and billions of peoples and, and nations worldwide at risk. Um, and, you know, whether or not this material is actually prohibited, whether or not this material is actually harmful, you cannot possibly go through everyone's content online to see and therefore catch criminals um, online. And just my last point before I hand it over is that there is absolutely no way for these security vulnerabilities, which governments are asking to build into platforms to only then serve law enforcement purposes. At some point, the, the the keys or these back doors or you know exceptional access is going to become available to malicious third parties who will then find very easy quick ways to be able to exploit these vulnerabilities thank you so much Nini. i, I can um, come in on this one as well sorry can, Mallory? i can come in yeah. as well on this one because i think there's some interesting trends like having watched um the policy debates for well over a decade now and how it's different. I think one of the changes in some of the legislation we're seeing, particularly in um, Western countries, is less prescriptive, like the traceability requirements and more just kind of um, figure it out. We don't, we don't, we're not going to prescribe how it's done, but um, we trust the platforms to, to do it. So just do it. Um, that's one big trend. The other trend is, um, like Nidhi pointed out, they're not just looking for content. It's not about um, can you take this encrypted message and decrypt it so we can look at the message. It's way more of a backdoor. It's not It's not a backdoor. It's beyond that now because um, countries are looking for um, the ability to um, ask for metadata and traceability. I, I like to think of the traceability as enhanced metadata. Can you build a platform that will now track um, where messages came from, how many people have seen them, who sent it, et cetera. That's a big ask actually of the way that a lot of these are designed. Another thing that has been requested is, can you get just essentially a pin register? Not just can you decrypt this one message, but can you consistently send us all the messages from this user account in the future? Or maybe actually in the past, if you've saved them, could we also get access um, to those? Could we get access to the social network of the person in question? Um, we'd like to know who their contacts are, who they've been talking to, how often, that sort of thing. So there's a lot actually in um, in some of these requests. It's not just about can you decrypt this one piece of content. And so to design um, platforms that do all of that is there. It's a bunch of feature requests essentially. Um, I also wanted to point out another trend that I think is becoming very common, not just in the encryption debate, but in a lot of other spaces where the technology is both the problem and it's the solution. So if encryption is the problem because it's now made, um, you know, drug dealers and other kinds of criminals like, you know, hidden from law enforcement, it is now also has to be the solution in that it will help us catch them and it will help us build evidence and we can submit that evidence to court. And we so it's a bit of this weird paradox. And I think the other thing too is, um, at least in the case of um, the laws that focus on content. So they're specifically focused on types of content that should be forbidden. So not all encryption laws do this, but some of them do. They're built on top of a shaky assumption that um, machine learning computer vision is any good. Um, and it's not really, because we know that a lot of this, and this is go, goes back to a point Namrata was making before, we know that a lot of this objectionable lawful con unlawful content or lawful but awful content is um, already on 
social media platforms that are not encrypted. It's everywhere. It's really hard to track and trace and take down. Um, and so some of the proposals for the technical proposals, for example, are to, you know, instead of decrypting messages, maybe you could do some very fancy homomorphic encryption. I mean, I'm not going to go into the details, but like if you think that, you know, AI and computer vision and detecting this content is difficult now, wait till you throw lots of layers of, of strong encryption on top and it will not get easier. Um, and then lastly, and I think this is the other trend, um, is on the client side scanning proposal. That is not just a proposal related to uh, messages or, or conversations. It's actually something that could affect um, our storage of, of content. So it could affect the content we have um, on our phones that we're not planning to send. It could affect the content on our phones that um, is maybe up, uploaded to a cloud, which often in, in modern, De mobile device operating system happens automatically without a lot of thought by users. Um, and so this goes beyond also um, intent, right, to to share and distribute illegal content. It could just be um, sitting on your phone. So those are some things I think that hadn't been said before that I wanted to make sure we um, included in this discussion. Thank you very much, Mary, for jumping in. And actually, my I, I did want to shift the conversation a little bit from the rights framework and the threats uh, towards a more technical angle that you already um, started doing. Uh, but my question for you, Mallory, was uh, if you could speak uh, about how encryption has shaped the architecture of the modern internet. Um, and then uh, after that, uh, how should the implementation and use of encryption continue to evolve? Good, so much more fun to talk about the positives, <laughs> the positive framing of, of the use of encryption. So um, I think that we've um, come a long way. There's a lot more encryption um, pretty much everywhere. I'm not just talking about um, apps and, and messaging apps, but um, starting with you know transport encryption for um, accessing websites. It's now um, using encryption, which again has a central service, so it's not end-to-end -end encryption, but it's it's gone a long way and it's been really important um, for the ecosystem and for human rights because it protects what um, users are looking for, it protects privacy, it also is a cybersecurity measure. There are lots of benefits to that and that's been ongoing. There's been also um, efforts to then um, encrypt DNS lookup. So um, by leveraging transport encryption for the web, you can also do DNS lookups that way. It prevents not, it doesn't just keep uh, users private and um, data about what they're looking at. It also is a nice circumvention technique for blocks that use domain name blocking. So it has this sort of, so if I were to say, you know, one of the things that um, has been a, a good trend is we've been able to connect the dots between, um, you know, censorship circumvention and privacy on, on this um, with the, the change, with changes to um, the modern internet, um, to your point, and then of course, right, we've we've have this trend now of um, more end-to-end -end encryption, more um, encryption of content that we intentionally put in the cloud. Um, we use encryption now on our devices. So our devices themselves, when they're off or when they're at rest, um, are, are encrypted. Um, so it is it is becoming more ubiquitous, and I think that has implications for the ways that um, now any sort of measures um, to either moderate traffic or to, um, you know, do other things on the network are really pushed to the edges. They're pushed to um, the ends, actually, where user devices exist, where the applications are, and that has a positive impact on um, users' ability to understand um, and control their data and to understand where it is because they can be more assured that while it's out of their hands and traveling to its destination, no one else can see it but them. So that's the idea. And I think those are some important things too. Um, and I think to your, to your second question, um, how should it continue to evolve? Um, I think that it should just be um, more ubiquitous. We'd like to see more um, instant messengers adopt 
end-to-end -end encryption. There's been, for many years, a push to get Twitter direct messages encrypted. We'll, we'll see if that happens or not, um, <laughs> or if it matters. Um, there's, um, you know, I think there's there are more apps out there that could use it. We know that Facebook, for, or Meta, did um, an, an analysis of, um, a, actually, a human rights impact assessment on if it used end-to-end -end encryption on both, um, on all of its messaging apps, besides WhatsApp, which is already end-to-end -end encrypted, would it have an impact on, for example, um, parental uh, settings um, in Messenger and things like that. Um, so those are actually really positive. We want to see more of those. And so we're hoping for um, more ubiquitous adoption at all of the different, in all of the different ways that I've just mentioned where encryption is now becoming more ubiquitous. Thank you very much, Mallory. Excuse me. Um, I want to be thank thank you so much. Yes, I want to be mindful of our time since we are um, we don't have that much time left, and I do want to make sure we uh, focus on the arguably the main question of this uh, session. Uh, and I wanted to address this question to all of you, uh, the speakers, um, whoever wants to come in with an answer or some reflections. Uh, based on everything that we've heard um, over the past 20 minutes, uh, do you think that encryption is an emerging forest generation right? Uh, especially because of its enabling and protective functions uh, in relation to um, uh, some of the core uh, rights, such as freedom of expression, privacy, arguably many more fundamental human rights. That's a question for all of the three speakers. Natal, would you mind starting? Sure. Um, that's, that's a great question, Anastasia. And I think um, there are actually two prongs to this question, right? Like, do we want the right to encryption per se, or do we want um, access to encrypted channels as being recognized as an integral part of our existing human rights, including the right to privacy, the right to freedom of expression, or even the right to freedom of assembly and so on, right? The whole gamut. Um, and I think, uh, Encryption is a critical enabler of a lot of the human rights that we already have. Um, it, it allows us to exercise our right to privacy and all these other human rights that we've been talking about. And um, the other reason I encourage a greater focus on the existing rights framework um, and not a kind of tech focused um, uh, conceptualization of the right is because tech has to and will keep evolving. Uh, we will, in due course of time, have even stronger methods of um, online, of ensuring online security and safety. Um, today, it is end-to-end -end encryption, and I'm sure um, other methods that Mallory could speak to. But I think when we then uh, go through, let's say, years of effort to get right to encryption recognized as a right, we risk having to do it all over again the moment we have a stronger tech. So I do think that access to encryption and similar secure channels and so on has to be recognized as a critical component, inalienable component of our existing human rights. And the question is just how should we do it in a way that builds on all the work that technologists, security experts, privacy advocates, and so many others have done over the last many decades? And how will it build a good foundation in a manner that is sustainable even going forward and, and allows us to kind of um, propel innovation and build this jurisprudence of online privacy and the kind of open, free, and secure internet that we imagine. Um, if, if I could add to that, uh, um, Namrata, I, I think, um, you know, tech for tech's sake, um, in my opinion, means little. What, what that serves is is the question we we need to ask ourselves. Nidhi, we've lost your audio. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. We can hear Nidhi online. Yeah. Maddie, yeah. Yeah, we can hear you too. Go ahead. Okay, sorry. I'll just recap that. Um, I was I was adding to Namrata's point, saying tech for tech's sake means little, but you know what end technology serves is what we need to ask ourselves. 
And, uh, you know, we've seen the first, second and third generations of human rights. And we're at that juncture where we're asking ourselves what should and should not be recognized for the fourth generation of human rights. Um, I feel like even, even, even the access to the internet is not yet recognized as a human right, even though since 2012, there is widespread international agreement that, that the realization of the first, second and third generations of human rights depends very much on the ability to be able to access the internet if one wants to and does have access to the internet. Because I do recognize that we have a long way ahead of us to connect the unconnected. Um, but having said that, uh, those of us who are connected um, for, for the realization of our civil, political, economic, cultural, social, collective rights even, um, you know, we, we do absolutely rely on the internet and all of the technology that, you know, there is to make sure that we're, we're, we, have, we have access to safe communication, we have access to secure communication, we have access to private communication, and the ability, in my, in my opinion, to have that choice. It is, it is the resting of that choice away from uh, citizens of democratic countries, um, or citizens of many, many different countries, that is the question here today. It's not so much whether um, you know, encryption per se is what we're fighting for. I think we're fighting in a broader sense for the ability to make that choice, right? Um, so I'll hand it over to uh, Mallory. Yeah, I really agree with your point about how access to the internet and meaningful access are inter intertwines with, with encryption. Um, and I also agree that with with um, Namrata that it's enabling. This is, um, it's not about, is encryption um, itself a right, but it's an enabler. Um, I think the one interesting thing about, to, to center the technology for a moment, I think it's it's created, um, an awareness that freedom of expression and privacy from a technical perspective are very intertwined. Um, so to have, and I don't know that that existed sort of previously, maybe there's something about an anonymity and expressing your opinion, but this is something deeper than that. Because if you are unable to see where someone is connecting from or what they're looking at, it's really hard to intercept that and to stop it. So that's one sort of way in which they, they converge. And so encryption not doesn't just keep us private like in some places where the primary concern is not privacy it's access to information because there's a lot of blockages so there's a lot of um, information control encryption is one way that people share content with one another um, and and of course then in a lot of other places encryption is simply something that protects them and their banking transactions and and their private conversations and so on that's quite ubiquitous. Um, and then another point I wanted to make too was that this isn't also about online only. Um, we think of encryption as like something that you need when you are vulnerable because you've just gone on the internet. But it's actually something that has a really important impact on civic space in the offline world. Um, in 20, was it 2014 that WhatsApp announced it would be encrypted or was that 2016? Uh, sorry, it was one of those. I think it was 2016, WhatsApp um, became end-to-end -end encrypted, and that was also the same year that there were massive protests in Zimbabwe. Um, and so the, it was a weird moment because um, protesters were using WhatsApp. Well, everybody used WhatsApp for everything, but they were in particular using it to coordinate protests. And, and the repression was around, um, well, first they tried to say, we can still read your messages and if you um, are organizing protests, we're going to throw you in jail. Um, and so people were really confused. They're like, can they actually read our messages? We thought they couldn't. Um, and then the second thing that happened was, of course they couldn't, and so then they just blocked WhatsApp. <laughs> but everybody were, everyone in Zimbabwe, they had a huge market. Um, everyone was using WhatsApp, so it, it really had a huge impact on everyone, not just the protesters. And that's evidence that, you know, into encryption also is um, important for our offline activities as well, not just when we're online. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, Namrata, Niti, and Mallory for your wonderful comments. Um, yeah, they are all very to the point and I couldn't agree more. Uh, it's We have 15 minutes left for the session and I would like to make sure um, our both uh, guests on site and online have the time uh, and opportunity to ask their questions. Uh, we'd be happy to see your questions in the online chat if you've joined on Zoom. but. Um, uh, 
to those who want to ask questions on site, uh, please raise your hands. And Mallory, could you um, could you please facilitate uh, if there are any questions? There are a lot. <laughs> Which is fantastic. So maybe we could. I don't see anything. So sorry to interrupt you. I don't see anything yet in the Zoom chat. So maybe we can start with several online. I think oh, offline. Sorry. I think we'll just kind of do it toward a tab. We'll go in this direction if that works for everyone. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. And so I guess with the time left, just as a time check, right? We'll have. Um, we have about thirty minutes. Thirty minutes left. Is that right? Okay. Well, if we we have an hour, that would be fifteen minutes left. That's why I'm. Well, we started. We started a bit early. We hustled people out of the room. So I think we can go till quarter past on the schedule. So we have thirty minutes. So, but just a okay. reminder because we have so many in the queue to keep it as brief as you can. If you want a response from us as well. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think that um, what we have le uh, learned to the, from today's session uh, would. Um, uh, some effort, uh, some duties to the National Human Rights Institution. Uh, we have been discussing um, the duties of the National Human Rights Institution in the digital era, and um, I think uh, it's the, the right time to re review uh, Paris principles that formulated all the National Human Rights Institution all over the world. And I think it might be uh, appropriate to talk about a declaration dedicated only to um, um, explain exactly the duties of the National Human Rights Institution in uh, protecting the, the right to technology and the right to um, uh, digitalization, uh, also and the right to access to, to the uh, internet and to the information. Thank you. Thank you, panelists, for the wonderful uh, presentations. My name is Kian Justinson. I work for Freedom House's Technology and Democracy Portfolio. Uh, very much appreciated all of your insights. Um, I know we spoke, uh, you spoke tangentially about homomorphic C scanning and sort of the fight against C scan. I'm going to see if I can bring that bogeyman into the room. Um, of course, polymakers, policymakers in the US and, and I think Western Europe as well have kind of framed encryption as a threat and an obstacle to the fight for child protection. Um, and so I wonder um, if the panelists could address um, first to what extent you've seen that trend outside of the global north. So it, whether this is um, this sort of logic is being picked up um, in, in um, other countries and regions around the world. Um, and second, uh, how you would frame this this argument or the response to that argument in terms of um, human rights as we've been speaking about and particularly the the rights of children thank you hi my name is Chris Fuzzle. I work with the Dutch government on foreign affairs um first of all the Dutch have a Cabinet position from 2016, which we clearly state that we promote end-to-end -end encryption, and bring that up in discussions worldwide. That's something that we keep doing. Um, one of the things that we um, so I've got, I've got a comment and a question. A comment is that um, the the arguments that we have for encryption are like they're very divided, right? We've got the people that are trying to combat illegal stuff online, and we've got people that are saying. That, that are saying that these are human rights, um, basically human rights. And I think that there's a third argument where you can find each other, which is more in the like the security space, the hybrid warfare space, because a lot of these encryptions also protect national security interests. I would really argue all to, to, to maybe um, address that point more often, because I think that it would resonate better with, better with other um, governmental speakers or, or the people that you have a discussion with. The question that I have for to the speakers is in this room previously we had a discussion on regulating platforms we were talking a lot about these walled gardens i was wondering i think that encryption has a, an effect on that because everyone is locked in partly due to the encryption in systems that are well fully encrypted or can't use signal to send a message to whatsapp so should we do something about that as well thank you um hello uh, i'm masayuki uh, I'm being involved with the development of um, anonymizing communication technologies like um, uh, I2P, TOA, or FreeNet. And uh, maybe it's just me, or uh, I might be uh, confused, but uh, I felt that end-to-end -end encryption and uh, anonymizing communication technologies, or like uh, anti-metadata analysis technologies like TOA, are uh, being confused here. 
Um, end-to-end -end encryption is um, essential technology uh, for anonymization, but uh, they are not same. And um, so, I mean, I think some application of end-to-end uh, -end, uh, encryption is uh, is the easier target uh, of being regulated. And uh, I personally fear that, uh, and of course, both can be regulated separately. So um, I feel that um, I think I, anonymization is more important when it comes to human rights. And uh, um, if some application of end-to-end uh, -end, uh, encryption are regulated, I think end-to-end -end, uh, encryption itself will be witch hunted. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, my name is Lars Eggert and I chair the IETF at the Internet Engineering Task Force. So I work on the plumbing of, of the internet, so several layers below where the discussion was today. Uh, I want to sort of bring the point that to the internet, there's a lot of old equipment there um, that was deployed sometimes decades ago and that has sort of inbuilt assumption about what traffic looks like and what it can do. And we, those of us who work on the, on the plumbing, right, we increasingly find that we need to use end-to-end -end encryption as a tool to evolve the internet infrastructure forward because it lets us punch through these old devices. They will never get, you know, taken away unless they like burn out or something like that. And so, you know, there's a, there's a, for us, end-to-end -end encryption is, is useful for all the things that were discussed today, right? And thanks for the great discussion. But for us, it's also a means to evolve the core of the internet forward. And, and when discussions happen about, you know, should it be restricted or, or, you know, or what should be done with it, it, Doing something that would limit the use of end-to-end -end encryption would take away a, a vital mechanism for us to keep involving the, the connectivity layer uh, into the future. And I wanted to raise that point. Thank you. I thank you very much for such a sorry. Go for it. <laughs> okay, Tapani uh, Tarvan and Electronic Frontier Finland. Uh, several people have mentioned already the client side scanning, which I think is the most horrible privacy invasion in, invention since forever. And that raised the point is that encryption, right to encryption is all but useless if you can't trust the device you are doing it on. So you would have to bundle this to right to control your own device. And I think I'll leave that. The ask question is, do you agree? Very sorry about that. <laughs> My name's uh, Alex. I work in uh, the UK government in the Department of Digital. Um, so like the Dutch government, the UK government is a very strong supporter uh, of encryption. Um, however, I think it is really important that we are, are really clear-eyed about um, some of the issues that there are here. And I just want to illustrate one particular case that we had in the UK before coming to my question. So in 2021, uh, a British man was sentenced to a, a very long prison sentence because he had been conducting horrific child abuse of hundreds of hundreds of children online. Um, data and, uh, and messages which Meta were able to provide to the investigating officers were vital in securing that, that, that conviction. Had Meta um, implemented end-to-end -end encryption on all its channels uh, uh, before that point, that man would not have been convicted and would still be abusing children. So I think it's really important that we kind of have that child safety point in our minds and that, you know, uh, that it's a very real issue. However, I think we can all agree in this room that end-to-end -end encryption is a good thing and child abuse is a very bad thing. So my question for the panel is, how are, are they are they sure that we have done, uh, that, that there has been enough innovation in this space, particularly around uh, the very specific question around tackling child abuse imagery uh, on end-to-end -end encrypted channels? Are, are we really sure that we've done enough to explore that issue? Um, obviously, we don't want to open back doors uh, and create uh, and break encryption, but on that specific issue, are we absolutely sure that, that, that we have bottom that out. Uh, in the UK, we, we are launching um, a safety tech challenge fund, which is kind of looking to explore this issue. Um, and I think it would be great if kind of more countries and bodies could explore this as well. But I'm really interested to hear from uh, the expertise that we've got uh, on the panel. And thanks again for such an inter interesting discussion. There were such good comments. Um... I guess yeah. we could Are all there just respond left right? in the room or Can you hear me? Yes. Sorry, just wanted to make sure. Are there any comments or questions left in the room? I think that's it for now, yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't think we have anything online, but we do have quite a lot of wonderful comments and 
interesting questions from the audience on site. So um, yeah, uh, Namrata, Aniti, and Mallory, um, uh, if you feel like you can comment or address some of them, please go ahead. Yeah, I'm keen to have Namrata or Niti come back in. If you want to go ahead and start, I think we could just answer sort of whichever questions we took notes on and stuck out for us. I could, um, sorry, Niti, go ahead. Did you want to say something? No, I was actually just saying, could we uh, start with Mallory and then um, I could jump in and Namrata, you could as well. Sounds good. Uh, sure. I mean, it's they're all really good comments and questions, and it's hard to um, not want to respond to all of them. But I will, um, yeah, I will try to keep it brief to some of them. So um, one, there was one question about um, regul, like the risk of regulating the entire space, where some. Um, you know, encryption, there's so many different examples of it. I think you brought up a really good point. So are we risking some really solid, important aspects um, because um, other kinds of encryption are, are um, being regulated? I don't know that there's that much of a risk in what I've seen from the policy trends. There are cases where um, things are a little muddy, and at that point, as advocates, we can sometimes then come in and try to introduce some nuance. But I also think it raises the point that um, for for sort of end-to-end -end encryption, for example, that's been um, maybe slightly backdoored. I don't know if we can do that. I think it, it, there's there's something about um, uh, the national security element where it's almost like like no encryption would be better than weak. It's it, because it becomes a bit of a honeypot in a way, right? If you've got an app that says it's end-to-end -end encrypted, but it's behind some sort of for whatever jurisdictional reason or other thing, it's a little bit weakened. It's got some kind of backdoor. That's almost like a worse scenario, right? Then, um, and then the other one maybe is fully end-to-end -end encrypted. So I think you were sort of talking to the... I think so, yeah. That was the note Sorry, that I Sorry, maybe took, I was just... But, I, I, I didn't articulate it well right. enough. Apologies for breaking in. No, no that's So okay. my question is actually... My, my point was actually that that so in the Netherlands, for example, we have a big tech company called ASML, which makes tons of chips, technologies, and la la la. And um, so we see that that there's more there's more interest into the IP that we have about about the process that we have, and we consider that as a point of national security, and we want to protect that. So if we would have some some form of chat secure or some form of client side scanning there's an easy abuse to be made by nation state actors in order to hack those services. Because I mean, if the European Commission is going to write some program for us that we have to implement, well, let's hope that it will be very safe. But, but at least, I mean, if it will be one, if it will be one program, it, it would be a, a clear, clear, clear target for, for any nation state actors, right? And that aspect, we could, I think you could use that more often, that, uh, that if we have some weakened encryption or backdoor, that could also be easily be misused by other nation state actors. I'll try again with some other comments and feedbacks. No, no, to the point about um, client-side scanning, I also wanted to say, uh, and I often forget to say this in these um, discussions, that there's a there's a raging debate also in the US around compelled decryption. So this was around, you know, taking an iPhone and, and then you you say, no, I'm not going to decrypt it. I won't give you my face or my thumbprint or whatever. That is it legal to actually just, you know, can you compel something? And that's a civil, it's another civil liberties issue similar to client-side scanning, where um, you're basically turning one's device or user agent against them, against their best interests, which is, I think, um, it's good that it's controversial, I think, um, but, it, but it could be more controversial. I think we could come out uh, much stronger against things like client-side scanning and compelled decryption. Um, and then to the um, safety tech challenge, which is something that, um, my organization um, was aware of and followed up on and submitted comments to. I mean, one of the issues that I had with it um, was that it just assumed that um, that a tech solution started with um, we have an encrypted system and how do we get around that, rather than taking a larger frame, which is what are what are some approaches to that use um, digital technology to solve this problem, which is wider. So I felt that, you know, artificially narrowing it in that way limited the results, because I also really think that there are things we can do. And if we accept that end-to-end -end encryption is ubiquitous, strong, and, and people will use it, 
um, we, we accept that. We can, I think, build some interesting things on top of it. CDT did a report on how you actually do content moderation in end-to-end -end encrypted systems, and we didn't actually say you can't do it. We, they, we did say you can do it, there are a few ways to do it, and here's how you would, right? So there are possibilities, but I think that assuming that you have to break it and then asking people for their um, innovations around how it gets broken was a little bit um, sort of artificially narrowed. That's it. Back to you um, both online. Thanks, Mallory. Um, I could, uh, there was one question about um, the approach in Global South, um, how encryption is being characterized and how sort of that characterization could be responded to. Um, so to that point, yes, there very much is that characterization of encryption posing a threat um, of, of it creating this kind of dark space where law enforcement is not able to do their job. Uh, but I think a lot of the advocacy and responses have to also be tailored to the region, even though there might be uh, commonality in the challenges, right? So I think in terms of responses, um, some of the things that I think could work, one is to break the kind of polarization we're seeing, um, the kind of, which we, I think, touched upon a bit in our comments, the privacy versus safety thing. All of us agree that we need to have private spaces. All of us agree that there are terrible things happening, both offline and online. They need to be addressed. So I think to break that polarization, to see that the goal is, at the end of the day, same, and how to achieve it without undermining human rights. So I think, first, we have to kind of agree that the goal is the same, and we need to have that conversation. Um, the second is, I, I think there needs to be, uh, we need to challenge the disproportionate focus on the negative use case of this technology. Um, everything has a negative use case. And I think if we were to look at anecdotal evidence, um, there is also a lot of evidence on how because of lack of secure channels for communication, people in a lot of regions have been tracked down, people have lost lives. So um, I think just focusing disproportionately on one side will not lead us to long-term sustainable solutions that respect rights. It will be more of a knee-jerk reaction to something that we're seeing evolving around us. And as Mallory pointed out, we're all struggling to find that perfect solution. So right now, policies are just counting on tech companies to find a way to do it. So we need to come to that solution together, and admittedly, that is going to take some time. So that focus on just one side of the negative use case has to be changed. Um, the second, the third, uh, in how policies are framed, one should not have to count on the good intentions of law enforcement and government. The way it's currently done, we often hear the response that this will only be invoked in the rarest of rare cases. But the underlying problem is that ultimately, uh, a citizen has to count on the government's good intentions. And even if they exist, the very point of policy making is to create principle-based solutions that can prevent any kind of arbitrary application. So I think that kind of banking on good intentions and limitations that the government will place on itself is just not a good idea for the long term. And finally, I think uh, it's just again in terms of focusing on solutions. There are alternatives. There are alternative means of alternative means of investigating, be it capacity building or or um, the the kind of resources that Mallory just mentioned. CDT has done this report. Stanford had had done a report, and there's already progress happening in that direction. And this is a, this is an opportunity for all these various stakeholder groups to work together. How do we? strengthen alternative means of investigation without undermining this important tool. I can take a couple of others, but I'll just hand it over to Neeti first because I know we're also short on time. No, I just have uh, two very quick thoughts to add to what's already been discussed. Um, I think we've spent a lot of time collectively, you know, this panel talking about um, what encryption adds to our life, right, in terms of safety, security, and not just individual security. I think individual security is very much tied in with national security. Um, um, we've also spent a fair bit of time talking about privacy and, you know, how encryption, uh, due to its enabling nature, helps us all realize other human rights. So, you know, it's, it's not just tech some some random technology that exists in a vacuum today. So if I were to take all of those conversations we've had and, and ask people in this room, um, you know, to apply the same logic to also children, 
it's not that encryption serves adults and then miss serves children i think children are definitely safer because of encryption i mean children who have access to the internet and have the ability to use the internet to learn online or to or to um you know interact with their grandparents or to play games i think are safer because of encryption and i think there's also been you know certain parent accounts uh, uh you know who say please don't make me raise my kids in a world without encryption because my kids are safer with encryption um even when the whole uh apple client side scanning uh proposal had come in uh you know one of the key questions that that civil society had asked apple is how are you so sure that the guard you know the parent that you know you're relying on to to be able to direct a kid is the right person to do that can you as a technology company take that take that guarantee and you know very clearly apple could not right that proposal was withdrawn and and just the just the last thing i will say is that these problems are societal they existed before the internet existed and they will continue to exist in the future but i think societal problems cannot have technological solutions alone i think we need to find societal solutions for societal problems and tech has a role to play for sure but tech cannot be made the scapegoat or the ultimate sort of uh, provider of you know unilateral solutions in case of societal problems i'm not brushing off the 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 enormity of the problem we're on the same team here we're on the same side but i'm saying we need larger broader multi stakeholder dialogues to tackle what is essentially a huge huge societal problem thank you so much niti i want to um ask namrata if namrata do you have any other remarks since you mentioned that earlier or maybe we can jump into right into closing remarks also if there are no other questions just very quickly what uh, somebody said about um encryption also being very crucial for national security and the need to push that argument more um i i do completely agree i think um as mallory pointed out a lot of it gets lost in just communication data and safety for particular types of individuals and and niti also mentioned how it serves the wider economy it serves your government security national security so i think there are several prongs to it right and and i completely agree um as these conversations evolve depending on the tables where we're at um to achieve that final goal sometimes different arguments play different roles so i just plus one to whoever raised that point thanks thank you namrata <clears throat> so if there are no other questions are there any last minute remarks or questions left in the room and i do hope that we manage to uh, address all of them that were mentioned uh, before I think there was one, um, somebody asked about interoperability, or they made the point that these are all at the moment walled gardens, which is a really good point. <laughs> um, but mm -hmm. I think there's um, effort around, in general, um, doing more federated and interoperable messaging based on the Digital Services Act, um, which will only apply to gatekeepers. But in general, I think there's an interest um, definitely from um, human rights advocates and organizations like CDT and ISOC and so on to actually figure out ways to do um, interoperable end -to -end encrypted messaging or at least federated. So that hopefully will change. And the IETF is, is looking at that as well. There are folks um, interested in that problem space. So that's good news. Thank you. So if there are no more questions, um, we may take a few minutes for closing remarks. Just a few uh, a few remarks from each of the speakers would be great on today's session and on the takeaways. Sorry, and I said there was one question in chat in case you want to. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I did miss that while I was focusing on uh, keeping track. Okay. Uh, yes, there is one question indeed. Thank you, Namrata. Um, and actually, it's very similar, if not almost the same as we uh, stated in the description earlier in the session. It's or should encryption have special protections under international human rights law? Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. Uh, maybe Namrata, you could address that really quickly, and Niti or. Just a few comments because we don't have that much time left. Sure. So um, I think just to recap a little bit of what Nathie, Mallory, and I said uh, when this question came up, um, we think it is a crucial enabler for a lot of the rights that we have within the international human rights 
framework. Um, so uh, to that extent, yes, um, it, it should be recognized as um, playing a crucial role in folks being able to exercise that right. Um, second, we spoke about how it is very intertwined with um, access to the internet and that in itself is a challenge globally and uh, perhaps more so in specific regions. And um, without that being recognized as being crucial for fundamental rights, I think this that will have a very uh, direct impact on, on how we think of the right to encryption. And as Neeti put it, um, tech for tech's sake uh, does little. We have to look at the kind of goals uh, it serves. So I think more than just right to encryption, it is the right to uh, private and secure communication channels or just um, uh, protection of your data in ways that cannot be tampered with. So I think just within that broader framework, recognizing it as an important cog in the machine, essentially, uh, for people to realize their human rights. And I just wanted to jump into point people towards the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights put out a report roughly three or four weeks ago um, about um, the importance of encryption for human rights. It's an excellent report. Um, and so folks who want to understand how those connections are already being made within the human rights framework um, should definitely take a look and read it. It came out um, on the side of very, um, very strongly on, on the side of the ubiquitous use of strong encryption. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Namaste, Mallory. So, um, any closing remarks? Well, none from me except save encryption. Um, I would just say in my closing that there will be another session about encryption tomorrow. Um, I don't have the schedule in front of me, but I believe it's in the um, first afternoon session. Um, it's a open forum or a town hall of the Global Encryption Coalition. So um, multi-stakeholder, but mostly civil society. There are some small companies and then academics and technical advisors that um, comprise this global group that focus on policy threats um, and also technical ones as well. So it's a really robust, it'll be a really robust discussion. So please join us there if you want to continue the discussion. Thank you so much, uh, both to the organizers, the moderator, panelists, and also everybody who's there. Thank you for being so engaged for the fabulous questions and interventions. Um, I wanted to check if there is a way for us to get the resources that we shared on chat to the people who are atten attending on site. Yes, I just I just thought about um, that I can actually edit the description of the session and then I can post the links to the videos that we uh, all the videos, but and including the one that we wanted to show in the beginning that were produced by the Global Encryption Coalition to celebrate the Global Encryption Day. Um, I will um, edit the description so you can go back to the description of the session, see all of the uh, resources and links that were shared in the chat. Um, and yes, I just wanted to say thank you all for attending. It's great to see um, so many people in the room and also on site and uh, online. Thank you very much, Mallory, Niti, and Namrata for joining me here today for this really important conversation, most importantly for your wonderful and brilliant insights. And I hope that we can continue having this important conversation, not only at the IGF platform, but also in our communities, uh, among multi-stakeholders, um, yes, to keep protecting the encryption. And um, yeah, thank you very much. Thanks, Anastasia. Thank you. Have a lovely day. Thank you.